Hey, all right, now we're back with The Law with Lawson. And like I told you all, this is our second show. Um, so I got my Cracker Jack team back at the uh, studio. Eric and I are going to be uh, uh, bringing you this show today. So last week, I thought the show was like an hour. So I was kind of like, you know, uh, going off on different rants and stuff like that when I was bringing you to Law Raw. Um, but this week, I've been told it's a half hour show. So I got to get a lot in in a few minutes. But what we want to talk about this week is, uh, some of you may have seen in the news that one of the uh, uh, police officers in the George Floyd murder uh, is going to claim self-defense. You know, his lawyer went to court and, and you know, uh, uh, filed documents on what his client's defense is going to be uh, to this murder of George Floyd. And, and one of it was self-defense. And so people, you know, uh, Twitter world went crazy, right? Facebook world, just social media went nuts about this. And actually it is nuts. I'm going to explain to you why. But also, you know, why it is I still think it may be difficult to convict all uh, four police officers. Now, we know Chauvin, right? And and if you can put up the uh, uh, screen for me there, Eric. Uh, all right, so that, that there's our first slide, right? And so again, will self-defense allow some officers to walk? I don't think self-defense is going to fly. I'll explain that in a minute. Let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, Eric, yeah, there we go. And so the first thing we have to understand um, is a lot of people think that the sole reason that George Floyd was killed is because, as you can see here in this photo, that Officer Chauvin had his knee on his neck. And that did, uh, that had uh, uh, um, obviously uh, uh, caused his death. But also, if you go to the next slide, Eric, um, you'll see. These three officers all together. So you see Chauvin uh, on the left hand side with his knee on his neck. In the middle, you see this officer named Kunick. And then all the way down towards the uh, passenger door on the car uh, is Officer Lane. Now, if you can, if you you may not be able to see from that photograph, but Kunick actually is standing, is kneeling next to Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's back. And when we talk about positional asphyxiation, uh, and what that means is, uh, if we can go back to the, the, the last slide, Eric, real quick, the one that says positional asphyxiation. What that means is when you put some, when you put somebody down in a prone position, right, you have them flat on, on, on the surface and you put pressure on them, the person can't breathe. Uh, and so when you hear Eric Garner from New York say, I can't breathe, when you hear George Floyd say, I can't breathe, uh, that's because when you're putting pressure on the back and the person is laid in a, uh, uh, a prone position, air is coming out. And when they try to breathe in, they can't expand their diaphragm. So air is not coming back in. So you sometimes, and, and you'll hear the policeman says, well, you're not having, you're talking, so you're able to breathe. Uh, and I think there was one mayor from, um, who made this comment about George Floyd in the, in the press. Well, obviously he could breathe because he was talking. That's not the issue. The issue, and they're not actually being choked, like physically choked around the neck, right? To where you can, uh, it's the pressure and the diaphragm can't come and expand. And it causes um, the person, uh, a lack of oxygen to the brain, the person passes out and then just dies from um, lack of oxygen, okay? And so now, let's go on to the next slide, uh, Eric. So now that we know, um, all these three individuals, they got charged with aiding and abetting second degree murder. Okay. So you got Chauvin who's charged you, 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 with his knee on his neck. Chauvin gets charged with second degree murder. Okay. And the other three, the one standing up, Tao, and the other two all get charged with aiding and abetting Chauvin in uh, second degree murder. Let's flip. Now, what is that? What, flip to the next slide. What, what is second degree murder? Um, and, and it kind of shows you right there. All right, second degree murder. And then I highlight it in yellow, right? Whoever does either of the following is guilty of unintentional murder, right? It's unintentional. That's what they have. I still believe it's first degree murder, but that's another show. Because I believe, I believe that Chauvin, when he, when he knew that, um, when Chauvin knew after people kept saying to him, he, he's unconscious. When Chauvin knew, Chauvin won with his knee on, on George Floyd's neck, when he knew, right, 
that 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 uh, Floyd had no pulse anymore because he had been told that. Um, he still kept his knee on his neck. That's after uh, for two more minutes, a little over two minutes after he was told that Mr. Floyd had no pulse. Chauvin still kept his knee on his neck. I think it was premeditated at that point that he knew the man had no pulse. He continued to, to keep his knee on his neck. He knew the man wasn't moving. At that point, I believe that, that, that he intended to cause Floyd's death, but that's neither here nor there because he's only charged with second degree murder. So getting back to it, the, the, the second degree murder is, um, and if we can put that slide up there one more time for our viewers. I'm gonna bring you the law wrong, right? So whoever does either the following is guilty of unintentional murder in the second degree. It may be sentenced to imprisonment for now. So if he gets convicted, he being chauvin, he's gonna look at 40 years. But here's what it causes the death of a human being without intent to affect the death of any person while doing what? While committing or attempting to commit a felony offense. Okay, so what felony offense was Chauvin engaged in? when he caused the death of George Floyd, according to the prosecution, third degree assault, okay? Now, that's what Chauvin's charged with, causing the death of George Floyd by engaging in a felony. What felony? The third degree assault. Okay, now, how do you aid and abet somebody in second degree murder? And Eric, if you can go to our next slide for our, for our, our lovely law class. So here's aiding and abetting. All right, so if you look at this slide that talks about aiding and abetting, a person is criminally liable for uh, a crime committed by another if the person intentionally aids, advises, hires, counsel, or conspires with, an, with or otherwise procures the other to commit the crime. What are you talking about, Lawson? What, uh, go ahead and take that slide off because these people are getting mad. They're like, hey, man, ain't nobody trying to learn all that fancy lawyer language. <laughs> what, the, what the hell does that mean? Here's what it means. It means that you have to know that the person that, that you're helping is committing a crime and you are agreeing to aid and abet them in committing that crime. Um, let me give you an example. Y'all know Jay Fidel, who, who, who does all this think tech stuff. So let's say Jay, uh, you know, and Jay kind of looks, he, got, he, he looks highly suspicious, but let's say I asked Jay to give me a ride to, um, 7-Eleven. I said, Jay, you know, let's, let's give me a ride to 7-Eleven. He takes me to 7-Eleven. And so I say, Jay, keep the car running. I'm going to run in here and, and, and buy me a, a, a soda and come back out. So Jay says, okay, I'll be here when you get back. So Jay's sitting out in the car. Car is running. He's listening to music. And I go in there and I rob the 7-Eleven. Yeah, I robbed 7-Eleven. I come back out in the car and I tell Jay, let's go and hurry up. And Jay takes off. Right, we go about two blocks and the policeman pulls us over and they, they arrest me for robbing a 7-Eleven. And Jay like, hey man, what's going on? They tell Jay, hey, put your hands behind your back. You getting arrested too. For what? Aiding and abetting. All right, now what do you think Jay's defense is going to be? Right, his defense is going to be, I didn't know that he was committing a crime. Yeah, I drove him. I Because in reality, factually, I helped him get away. He jumped back in the car. He told me to drive. I drove, right? But I'm not doing that to help him commit a crime. I was not agreeing, right, to help him commit a crime. And so when we talk about aiding and abetting, if you can put that back up there real quick for me, Eric. So now, so now when, when, when you look at that aiding and abetting slide, it, it makes a little bit more sense to you. It personally, intentionally aids, advises, hires, counsel, or conspires with or otherwise procures the other to commit the crime, right? You have to know. And so, 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 so what's the officer's defense going to be? Well, we kind of know. Uh, so Officer Kunick is the one that was in the middle. And so I, we, Eric and I showed you that slide earlier where you can see Officer Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck. In the middle, there you go. In the middle is Officer Kunick. He's the one in the middle. And then all the way down by the passenger door it is Officer Lane. And why is that important? Because Tunic actually has his knee on the back of George Floyd, on, on George Floyd's back, and he's putting pressure on it. He is contributing to the death of Floyd, right? Because Floyd can't, can't, he cannot expand his diaphragm. But the question is, does 
the, the, does Lane and Kunick and Tao know that they're actually aiding and abetting Chauvin when he has his knee on George Floyd's neck and committing a crime? Or are they saying that we're just ignoring policy? And so let's go to our, to our next slide, Eric. So, um, and so, so uh, in, in order to prove that, 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 that the officers aid and abetted, the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt these two things, that the officers knew that Chauvin was going to commit a crime, and they intended their presence or actions to further the commission of that crime. That's a high, that's a heavy burden, isn't it? Right. In other words, that again, going back to my example with Jay, you had to show that Jay knew that that I was going to commit the crime of robbery when I walked into 7-Eleven, and you had to show that Jay intended his presence to help me commit that crime. Right. And so again, that. All three other officers, their defense is going to be, we did not know that he was engaged in trying to kill this man. So how, how does, uh, how do I want to say this? Okay, so I had, like, you probably, can you see this? Look, I had all these documents right here. These are um, the actual transcripts from the camp, the uh, body cams. You know, the officers had the body cams right here. So these are the transcripts from the body cams that uh, Kunick's lawyer, the defense lawyer, who claims that his client killed George Floyd in self-defense. We'll get to how crazy that is in a few minutes. But Kunick's lawyer filed all these documents with his defenses. And so when you read through the, the body uh, 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 cam transcripts, and you can hear what the officers are saying to each other, and some, so again, keep in mind that he, uh, the knee was on Mr. Floyd's neck and he was in that position for eight minutes and 46 seconds, all right? And so a couple of minutes after they get him into that position, you can hear Officer Lane. Lane is the one who's all the way at the end near Mr. Floyd's knees, holding him down, right? Lane turns to Chauvin and says, shouldn't we move Floyd over, turn him over? Because Floyd, at the, all the time, all during this time, Mr. Floyd is saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mama, mama, I can't breathe. So Lane looks at Floyd, looks to Chauvin and says, hey, shouldn't we turn him over? Because I'm concerned about uh, excited delirium. And, and again, for lack of time, but excited delirium happens when you have a person in the prone position. And because they're having trouble breathing, it could generate a heart attack. Um, and so, the police training. I did one of these cases in 1994 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, many of you may know that I used to do these types of cases and sue the police when they killed unarmed men, women, and children in Cincinnati and other parts of the tri-state area. And one of the first cases I did involved a man named Daryl Price in Cincinnati. Uh, and and Daryl was built a lot like George Floyd, um, you know, and, and just watching this video but George Floyd reminded me of that case. And I remember going down to the uh, coroner's uh, uh, lab and looking at uh, Daryl Price's body. And I had the coroner turn Mr. Price over in the prone position so I could see if there were any marks on his back. And I could see the knee prints that the officer had left on Mr. Price's back and the pressure they had put on him. Uh, and then they claimed because he had uh, traces of cocaine in his system that he died from excited delirium. After that case, uh, the city of Cincinnati and that police department changed their training. And most police departments did throughout the United States that whenever you put somebody and you have them secured in that prone position and they're handcuffed and they're secured, you have to immediately roll them over or, or sit them up or stand them up so that you don't kill them from positional asphyxiation. That is standard training. So why are you saying all this, Lawson? Because when Lane, right, the officer that's on Mr. Floyd's knee and holds his, his, his knee area down, turns to Chauvin. After everybody keeps hearing Floyd say, I can't breathe, he says to Chauvin, don't you think we should turn him over? I'm concerned about excited delirium. What Lane is saying to Chauvin is, look, man, we ain't supposed to leave him down here like this. That's what Chauvin, that's what Lane is telling Chauvin in front of Kunick. 
our, he didn't say it, and, and, and he didn't say our training tells it. What he says is, I'm concerned for about excited delirium. And what does Chauvin say when Lane says it? Chauvin says, that's why we have him down here like this, and we're going to leave him like this until the ambulance comes. Right? Just ignores the training. Now, that's a couple of minutes in. And so minutes and minutes continue to go by. Go ahead and put up our next uh, slide for me, Eric. All right, so the first offense that uh, Kunick's lawyer filed, and I'm laughing because it actually it is laughable, is the uh, self-defense. And I'm not even gonna go through all this stuff. We all kind of have an uh, understanding of what self-defense is. You know, you, you have to, oh my God. You can only use that force necessary to stop the force that's coming at you. A police officer's right to use self-defense for the most part is no greater than yours or mine, right? You can only kill somebody or, 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 or take human life or cause serious physical harm if you believe that person is trying to cause you serious physical harm or death or they, they escape, they may do that uh, to the public, right? And, and so I, I don't know why, and, and maybe, uh, Maybe the lawyer hasn't been paid a lot of money. I don't know, but I mean, this is the dumbest defense um, based on the facts that we know that you could put up. All right, so what's the second defense? Uh, Eric, what, what, what's the second? So he, the lawyer files these motions in court. And if, if, if we can go to the second slide. The lawyer files these motions in court for CUNY or CUNY, I don't know how they, I don't know how y'all pronounce it. Look, y'all see his name up there. Let's call him office, or former Officer K. Kune, Koenig, I don't know. So, okay, so some of you all are new to, to my teaching style. You're going to learn that I, my pronunciation of, of names um, needs some work. So I'm going to mispronounce a whole bunch of names, but you're going to understand uh, the law. So anyway, so this guy, this lawyer, God bless him. I mean, one day I'm going to tell y'all about the Kealoha trial here in Hawaii and, and some of the lawyer and I seen, you know, I was the uh, expert witness uh, for Hawaii News Now. So I got to watch that whole Kealoha trial last summer. <laughs> and you want to talk about some comedy lawyers. But, but let's get back to this guy up in Minnesota filing this defense. So his second defense, so the first defense was, hey, my client was acting in self-defense. In other words, and self-defense means this. It means I meant to kill you. When you're talking about self-defense with deadly force, what you're saying to somebody is I meant to kill them, but I had a legal right to do it. See, if you try to break in my house and I shoot you dead, that wasn't no accident. Me shooting you dead, that wasn't no accident. I meant to kill you because I thought that you were trying to uh, cause me death or serious physical harm. So self-defense ain't no accident. But what this goofy lawyer did in this case was, he says, my client, Kunick, the one with the knee on Mr. Floyd's back in the middle, acted in self-defense. In other words, he's, he's saying, I, my client, yeah, had a right to kill Floyd. Because if he didn't kill Floyd, Floyd was going to kill him. Now, I don't, I mean, if y'all go to YouTube and just Google defendant punches lawyer at counsel table, you're going to see all these videos of these uh, def <laughs> defendants getting mad at their lawyer because their lawyer sucks and just knocking them out right at counsel table in, in front of the jury. You can see that happening in this case. But let's go. Let me get back to this. I'm easily distracted. We only got like eight more minutes left. So let me. Eric, you got to keep me focused, man. So, all right. So, uh, what we're doing here is, so his second defense is, Kuhn's attorney cited a statute. It's a Minnesota statute, right? That says deadly force is justified only when necessary to protect a peace officer or another from apparent death or bodily harm. Here's what, it's going to be number two. Could it, yeah, so y'all can see, it's going to be number two that he's going to argue. To affect the arrest or capture, prevent the escape of a person whom the peace officer knows or has reasonable grounds to believe has committed or attempted to commit. And so what, what they're going to say is, look, and you can take that down here. Here's what they're saying. They're saying, look, if you go back to the video, we were trying to put Floyd in the, in the, in the police cruiser. 
and some of these, you know, when I, when you look at the uh, when you read the transcripts to all the um, body cam talk that was going on, there's a time when they're trying to put Mr. Floyd in the cruiser, and Mr. Floyd had been shot by a cop before, right, unjustifiably, but he had been accidentally shot by a cop before, intentionally shot by a cop um, before, and so he's telling him, "Look, I've been, I'm, he he was claustrophobic, he was paranoid." Uh, and he didn't want to get into the into the van. And so he's stiffening his legs. He's not fighting with the police or anything like that. You know how if you're trying to, you know, get somebody into a position and they, they keep their legs stiff, it's hard to move them. And so that's what Floyd is doing inside the van. So they pull him back out. They put him down in the prone position. And you kind of hear, right? And so um, all that time, what, what, what they're going to claim here is, is that he was resistant. He was trying to get away. And so we use that force necessary to capture or prevent him from escaping. And in doing so, and trying to keep him from escaping because we tried to arrest him and put him in the car and all that, we put him in this position and we were just going to hold him until, hold him there until the ambulance came. We had no idea he was going to die. Okay, I'm going to tell you why that one is, is uh, going to fail. All right, so what's, what's the third defense? Uh, the third defense, Q, as, as, so, you know, somebody's going to have to tell me, um, y'all think that's Q, right? K-U-E-N-G. The third defense Q will use, I don't, if it's right or wrong, that's what I'm calling it. All right, so the third defense Q will use, according to the documents, is authorized use of force by a police officer, right? Reasonable force may be used upon or toward the person of another without the other's consent under certain circumstances, which relevantly include when a police officer is affecting a lawful arrest or executing, right? So that's going to be his defense, right? But I, I've highlighted reasonable. And so a police officer can use reasonable force to arrest a person. And what Kunick is, and so what Kunick and, and the other officer, look, we were using reasonable force. When you look at the, here's the argument. When you look at the entire video, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, and you see that we tried to put him into the cruiser, and he wouldn't get in the cruise. We tried to get him to sit there and, and, and he just refused to, you know, bend his knees and, and be placed in the cruiser. Uh, and he's, and he's um, becoming so rigid that he's resisting. He's resisting us being able to transport him. And because we're using reasonable force and we use reasonable force, we wasn't beating on him or anything like that. When we had him on the ground, we just hold him there because no matter what we said, we just didn't believe that, that he was going to uh, comply with our commands to get inside the vehicle. That's gonna be their defense, okay? And they're, they're, what they have to show is reasonable force. And what does reasonable mean, right? Uh, and going to the next slide. Um, under Minnesota law, reasonable force may be used upon or toward the person of another without the other's consent, right? And, and again, it talks about that lawful arrest. And so uh, you can see them still in the photograph. Again, at this point, Everybody knows that Mr. Floyd is not resisting whatsoever. And so is that force at that point reasonable? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, real quick for him. So you see that, so when the jury, when the jury hears this case, the judge is gonna say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm gonna tell you what the law is when it comes to defining reasonableness, right? And the judge is gonna read to the jury this law. And, and it says, as I have a highlight, to determine if Officer Chauvin, if Officer Kunix and the Officer Lanes and Tao's force was reasonable, right? To determine if the actions of the peace officers were reasonable, you must look at those facts known to the officer at the precise moment he acted with force. Given due regard for the pressure faced by peace officers, you must decide whether the officer's actions were objectively reasonable in light of all the totality of the facts and circumstances confronting the officer without regard to the officer's own state of mind, intention, and motivation. Do you understand what that's saying? No, because it's all that, you know, when I went to law school, man, I used to hate reading all this language because to me it was just like, why don't y'all just tell me what the hell y'all mean instead of using all these big words? What it's saying is, look, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you can't get into what Chauvin was thinking. They could have had evil intent. That's not how you can judge it. You have to look at what was going on at that time from a reasonable officer's uh, standpoint, okay? 
and, 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 and it, it talks about looking at the facts and circumstances confronting the officer without regards to the officer's own state of mind, right? And so again, I think um, going to our last slide before I close this out, right? So you've seen all these defenses and, and put me up side by side of that, Eric. Um, because what, what the, what the uh, lawyer is doing is they're, they're throwing all their defenses at the wall and hoping something sticks. And that's not a good defense. Because really what it's saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, jury, if you don't believe I acted in self-defense, okay, then say that I acted uh, reasonable with respect to this issue. Or if you don't believe I acted reasonable with respect to this issue, just say I didn't know what was going on because I'm new to the force. Right. I think, again, it's hard to convict police officers in the United States. Over 95 percent of the police, first of all, it's hard to even get them charged. Over 95 percent of them that are the ones that are charged, 95 percent of them are found not guilty by jurors and by judges. So it's hard to convict. Here, I think the key is going to be this. With two minutes and I think 53 seconds left, and remember they had they were on top of Mr. Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds. At two minutes and 53 seconds, Officer Cuny, the one who filed all these goofy defenses with on behalf, you know, with his lawyer, Officer Cuny uh, tells Chauvin that he checked for uh, uh, Mr. Floyd's pulse and Mr. Floyd had no pulse. For two minutes and 53 seconds after Cuny after Lane, after Chauvin, after Tao knew that Mr. Floyd had no pulse, they continued to, to, to put pressure on him. In other words, you know this man ain't breathing and he ain't got no pulse. And for you to sit there and say at this point, and you hear, you hear people around saying he can't breathe, you're killing him. Citizens are screaming at these officers. And at one point, citizens start to approach to intervene and Chauvin, the one with the knee on his neck, pulls out his mace and tells the citizens to get back. They don't get up off of him. I'm talking about two minutes and 53 seconds longer. After knowing he had no pulse, they stay on his neck. Now at that point, I don't think that Lane or uh, 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 Kunick or Tao can say, we didn't know that, that continuing to let Chauvin keep his knee on his neck was killing him. At that point, you know a crime's being committed and you have a duty as a police officer to stop it and you didn't. And therefore, that's why I believe they're guilty. Um, but like I said, you're going to have to, um, um, you know, we got to watch the trial itself and see what happens. Because again, a lot of people that sit on the jury believe that, that, that the police are there to protect them. And they'll look at Mr. Floyd and say, you know what? I'm going to close out with this, Eric, because I know I got to go. But here, here's what happens in these trials. The, 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 the defense will paint the black man as a villain. Look at his record. Look at his prior. And he was on drugs. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know that these police officers protect you night and day. When they get up in the morning, they're risking their lives for you. And for you to sit there and second guess them in the moment of, of, of all this uh, chaos going on. And really what they're saying is, do you want to convict these officers who protect you for this person over here who ain't got no record? And that's the reason why Black Lives Matter has come to the forefront. Because no matter what, no one deserved to die like that. All right, so until next week, next week we're gonna talk about defunding the police and abolishing the police. And what's the difference, right? Uh, so, but until then, hey, this is uh, the Law with Lawson, bringing you the law raw. And I'll see you guys next week.